So I'm a scientist, and what I'd like to do today, in the next few minutes, is try and influence the way you think about your health. Hands up, uh, those of you who have had a cholesterol test. Okay, so we've probably got about 30% of you who've had a cholesterol test. Well, I'm with the 70% who has never had a cholesterol test. And I've not had a cholesterol test for three reasons. I didn't think I was old enough to have to worry about it. I've never heard my family talk about problems with high cholesterol. And I think I would eat a reasonably healthy diet. But I don't know whether that's the right decision. And generally, in our health, we don't really know what we have to do to stay healthy. Our health is an enigma, and we never know when it's going to fail us. Let me show you this picture. One of these two rather delightful twins is my mum. I don't know which one. Um, they were born in, on the 9th of May and in 1938. And this is my mother. I'm sorry about the quality of this photograph. It's a really old photograph. This is my mother as a grown woman with her husband, my father, and her two daughters. I don't think I've got a pointer, but my sister's in the red dress, and this is me in those rather cute dungarees, which I don't ever think you'd be able to buy anymore, but I think they're rather gorgeous. <laughs> now, when my mother was 43, she died. She died of what we believe was adenocarcinoma of the colon, colon cancer. And ever since my mother died, or that condition progressed quite a long way within my mum before the diagnosis. And by the time it was diagnosed, it was really too late to be treated. And ever since my mother's died, my sister, my brother, my brother, uh, younger brother, um, and myself have worried and been concerned about our own risk for colon cancer. 43 is a very young age to have colon cancer. I'm older now than my mother was when she died, and we're 30 years on, and I still do not know what my risk of colon cancer is. Let me give you some statistics. There are 100 new diagnoses of colon cancer every day in this country. Colon cancer, or bowel cancer in general, is the third most common form of cancer. And there are, in 2008, quite recently, there were 16,000 deaths from this condition. And if I had to add up the total number of deaths from colon cancer since my mother died to the present day, it's approaching half a million. And that's more than the total number of military and civilian in, um, deaths in the UK in World War II. Now, the sad thing about this is that colon cancer is curable if you catch it early. Let me give you another example. This is a really good friend of mine. He's called Steve. He's a gardener. In 1998, he, was he had a heart attack, first of all, and then two years later, he was diagnosed with diabetes. And for the last 10 years, he's really struggled to control his blood glucose. Now, he's, because of the non-remitting course of this illness, he finds himself totally dependent on insulin injections. Uh, and the prospects and early signs of secondary complications that are affecting both his hands and his feet. Now, let me just tell you a story that just exemplifies how serious these secondary complications can be in diabetes. I do quite a lot of work with the NHS, and a few weeks ago, I was sitting in a Midlands um, clinic, a diabetes clinic, waiting to see a, a consultant colleague. And I'm sitting in the waiting room, and across... On the notice board, there was a newspaper cutting from the Daily Mail. And on that newspaper cutting, it said, there's a picture of a woman, and it said, look closely at this woman to see the harsh, the cruel reality of uncontrolled diabetes. And I looked at this woman. She was a triple amputee. She'd lost one arm and two legs. The cruel reality of diabetes is that high levels of glucose pervading through the blood for prolonged periods of time damage peripheral nerves, cause infected sores to the feet that never heal and lead to amputation. More statistics. 2.3 million people have diabetes in this country. That's 5% of the nation's population. One million people have diabetes that is not yet diagnosed. We call it pre-diabetes. 
And the NHS spends £9 billion treating and supporting people with diabetes. That's 10% of their annual health care budget for the year. And there are 70 major diabetes-related amputations every week across the country. This is not 21st century medicine. This is firefighting. Some good news. Science and technology is evolving. It's moving at a very rapid pace. And I think science and technology evolution is going to help us. It's going to help us in four areas. Help us to understand the risk of disease. Understand, help us to screen disease so we can catch it early. Help us to align ourselves to treatments that work. We call it personalized medicine. And fourthly, through technology, information technology, Move us into this realm of informed self-care, and I'll come back to that piece. So let me tell you a little bit about advances in the science. I don't know how many of you have heard of the, uh, the thousand dollar genome, but this year, rumors have it that 2011 is the year of the thousand dollar genome. That is the ability to sequence our DNA that makes, comprises our genes and our individuality for a thousand dollars. So let me just give you some context. The Human Genome Project, which endeavored to sequence, the, generate the first sequence of the human genome, started in 1990, finished some 13 years later, and cost $2.7 billion. What we're trying to do now, and there are about, probably about half a dozen companies who are working very fast to improve the way that we sequence DNA so that it can be done cheaply. And that means that we can use it, and it can be brought into clinical practice. Why $1,000? That's the price point, I suppose, that the industry feels that this is the level that it could be embraced by clinical practice. So what does this mean for us? Well, it means a much more wholesome understanding of our risk for disease. We're already doing it to a certain extent, and these are just two genes that are known to be associated genetically with breast cancer. If you have mutations in BRCA1 or HER2, you have a higher risk from developing breast cancer than if you don't. And with HER2, there's actually been a, a, a development of, a, of a, 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 um, uh, an antibody therapy called Herceptin, which has been designed to interact specifically with mutated form of HER2. So if you are HER2 positive and you have breast cancer, this treatment will work. If you are not HER2 positive, it won't. It's quite a nice example of genetic use to tailor treatment, and that's a big area as well. For us, though, whole genome sequencing allows us to, do, to get the bigger picture. All the diseases that we're um, battling with today, the diabetes, the major cancers, cardiovascular illness, they're complex. They're complex genetically. They're environmental too, but from a genetic perspective, they're, they're, the risk factors and the genetic risk factors are not just one gene, but 10 or 20 or 30. And it's really important that we understand the whole picture. That's what whole genome sequencing is about. And maybe our disease risk profile would look something like this. This is just a schematic. Right? Higher risk in some diseases, lower risk in others. The conundrum for us is do we want to know? Well, if I had to address that question for myself, the answer would be yes. I absolutely do want to know what my risk for colon cancer is. Because if I knew what it was, I could do something about it through disease screening and treatment, if necessary. And I'd just like to focus a little bit on disease screening. A screening test is performed to detect the presence of a specific disease. And ideally, this is a blood test something that you can administer to lots of people relatively cheaply and easily. And you may have heard of the PSA test for prostate cancer. It's commonly used. It is probably the only uh, widely used um, blood-based biomarker for detecting um, any of the major cancers. And it's not perfect. For colon cancer, we don't have a blood test. We have a humocult test where you can measure blood in the feces. If you're over 60, you've probably had one of these through the post. Um, it's not very good, and compliance is a huge issue. Colonoscopy is the other way, where you can actually measure 
um, assess the inside of the bowel using an endoscope uh, under sedation. It's costly and it's not widely administered. We have no uh, pre, uh, screen for prediabetes and we so need one. So again, advances in science is helping to, us to, to, to improve the current status. We are now able to measure very small quantities of things in blood. Things like DNA, protein, uh, proteins, uh, microRNA, uh, things that generally may be exuded from the tumor, in the case of cancer, into the bloodstream. Or maybe things like antibodies, which are generated by the body in response to the disease. <coughs> and I'd just like to tell you about one study relevant to this audience, largely female, um, about a study that's ongoing in the area of ovarian cancer screening. It's called the UK CTOX study, uh, and it's run out of uh, UCL. And um, UK CTOX stands for the U UK um, Collaborative Trial for Ovarian Cancer Screening. And it was set up 10 years ago by uh, Professor Ian Jacobs at UCL and his colleague Usha Menon, Professor Usha Menon. And about 10 years ago, they wrote to a million women in the UK. They had to be over 50, and they had to be healthy. And asked them to participate in this 15-year study aiming to improve the way that we treat, uh, we, we uh, screen for ovarian cancer. They got 202,000 replies. Um, and this is probably the, the world's biggest ovarian cancer screening because of uh, the response that they got. And by 2015, they hoped to have an answer as to whether the UK should start to screen for ovarian cancer based on a blood test and ultrasound. Now, the thing about this study, these 200,000 202,000 women have, have volunteered their time, they've consented their time, the use of their data, they've filled out questionnaires, they've allowed access to the GP's record, and they've provided blood samples, serum. Some of them have provided blood samples annually. And they're allowing that to be used in this study, but they've also consented to this blood to be used, to be frozen, and then used to advance the screening, the way that we screen and diagnose other diseases, other cancers. So I'd like to finish just by telling you a little bit about how information technology is advancing the way that we manage our health. And I don't know whether anybody has heard of the shared uh, electronic health record. We had a big notice last year um, about this. And, uh, most of the GP surgeries that are obviously operating today have moved from paper records into electronic records, and you will have all noticed that. And there is a big movement. Here's an article from the Royal College of General Practitioners that's talking about the need to allow us to access our records. And I have a story. Um, I had an opportunity to sit in a, a, um, a seminar here in Cambridge by a, a doctor, a GP, called Amir Hanan. And he was talking about the value of the shared record. And I was very taken by his philosophy um, of, of the, the experience of the consultation between the patient and the doctor. His view was that the patient's the expert. We know more about our body, our symptoms, and the way we feel than the doctor does. All we need the doctor to do, very important role, is to put that knowledge in context with what they know, what's medically understood, and, and their experience of treating people with the same condition. It's a partnership, a true partnership. Anyway, I went to see him. I went up to his practice. It's the, uh, the Horton Thorley Medical Center in Hyde in Manchester. Just so happens to be where Harold Shipman practiced many, many years ago. And um, I went to see him and he's, he's basically worked with patients using advanced IT to allow them to access their medical records from home. They can um, book appointments. They can um, see all their prescription medicines. They can see every consultation letter that has ever been written to them for, to a secondary care specialist. And he's now just press release that he's got 1,000 people in his practice doing this. He's not the only one. There are a number of other places, and maybe your practice is one of these that's doing this. But it's a huge advance. And so just to be visionary for a moment, if we had to imagine, not too far on, the ability to be able to, to go into the GP surgery, 
have our DNA sequence on a little desktop machine in the, in, the, in the consultation room. And with a little bit of wizardry, see our disease risk profiles uploaded into our electronic health healthcare record alongside our disease screening tests. Imagine being able to share that record with your family. Or more importantly, leave it to your children so that they can understand their health in the context of their parents. We're not far away from this. It's a reality, so it's a vision that we can reach with advanced IT, disease screening technology, and the, whole, the opportunities for the uh, whole genome sequencing. So I've just got one last challenge, really. It's to take action. The, the value of this developing science needs us. It needs us to embrace it. And it is, there's lots of hurdles. I haven't talked about some of the challenges along the way, but if we embrace this in the way that's right for us, it'll work. Think about yourself first. If there's anybody here who has a health concern, talk to your GP. Secondly, think about your family. Think about what small step you could take to help your family, your children, have a happier, healthier life. Get involved, talk to your GP, talk to medical colleagues, find out what's going on, donate things, and help the cause, because it's really important. It's unnecessary for people to die from colon cancer, and it's unnecessary for people to suffer disability because of amputation, because of diabetes. I want to finish by showing you this photograph. This is my children having a happy moment on a Devon beach about two years ago. And I'm just going to dedicate this talk to this generation for their health and well-being um, because we've got to do better for them than we're doing for ourselves. Thank you very much.